Hello everyone, I am Cody Bunton. I'll be your instructor for IS688, the online version of this class this semester. Uh, first off, I want to say thank you for registering and taking the course. I'm excited and looking forward to the class. This, uh, this is the second time I've taught this class in an online capacity. Uh, and the course isn't very big in terms of registration this semester, so there I think there are five to seven of you maybe. If you're interested in meeting, having a virtual conversation, I have office hours weekly, there are open office hours that I'll talk about. I'm also open for scheduling. If you want to meet in person, I can do that or support that as well, either at the Newark campus or potentially at the Jersey City campus. Uh, just reach out and let me know and we'll talk. I did want to give you the opportunity to see me in person. Uh, this is kind of the background that you'll see uh, when I am giving lecture or when we're having meetings, uh, unless I'm in my office uh, on campus. Uh, so before I, w I get into lecture, I just wanted to take the opportunity to introduce myself so you can see me in a more visual medium rather than some disembodied voice, which you'll often hear uh, or often will be your experience with the lecture slides uh, that I'll post on, on YouTube and I'll talk about. So if you can meet me in a few seconds in the corner of your screen up here, then we will move into the slides that I've put together on introductions and course logistics. And here we are, as I said, this is IS6888, the web mining course. This is an introduction and course logistics lecture that will start off the beginning of the course. Uh, first, welcome. This class is on web mining. It's online and asynchronous. This is the only uh, online version of this class offered this semester. There is an in-person version of this class offered with Professor Hai Fan. If you're interested in taking that, I believe you might have the opportunity, though you should uh, take action on that quickly. So first off, who am I? As I mentioned, I'm an assistant professor of informatics here at the New Jersey Institute of Technology. Now, prior to being here, I was a postdoctoral fellow at the New York University Social Media and Political Participation Lab, which is now the Center for Social Media and Politics. We studied a lot of how people engage in online political discussion, how people are manipulated in online spaces, uh, online information quality, a number of things that are important for an informed public, uh, for democracy, for democracies to work. <clears throat> Prior to that, I was an intelligence community postdoctoral fellow, where I did work with the National Counterterrorism Center, looking at conflict in the aftermath of disaster in social media. This was done at the University of Maryland in the Center for Counterterrorism Research. And then I got my PhD in computer science from the CS department at the University of Maryland, uh, where I worked in the Human Computer Interaction Lab, doing work on social media and disaster and crisis informatics. Prior to getting my PhD, I was the director of research for a small cybersecurity company called Pikeworks that has since been acquired by Raytheon, where we did work on anti-tamper, which is basically protection of systems and hardware when the potential adversary has direct access to tamper with the technology. In terms of my research, I run the Infico Lab, or the Information Ecosystems Lab, doing work in three primary areas, all related to social media and online social networks. Uh, first, looking at crisis communications, social movements, and political participation. Now, one of the nice things about my lab is we look at a number of different tools that we leverage a number of different techniques to do this work from text mining to large-scale analytics or cloud computing uh, machine learning and network science and we do this in a lot of different spaces from facebook and twitter for a lot of social media content increasingly looking at youtube and how youtube's platform recommendation systems and platform moderation systems impact sharing in other spaces and online news consumption as well in terms of what I do outside of work, I'm particularly interested, or like movies, particularly these three, Hackers, The Matrix, and The Fifth Element, were some of my favorite movies, though it's been a long time since I've been to the theater. Uh, I have a motorcycle, it's a mid-90s uh, BMW uh, that I uh, maybe foolhardily like to take on, on long road trips, and I like board games as well, in particular Mysterium, which is a combination of Clue, which you've probably heard of, and Dixit, which you may not have heard of, uh, that I enjoy, but my partner maybe enjoys uh, a little less. Uh, all right, so that's enough about me. Now I'm going to drop out of your screen and move to the disembodied voice for the rest of this lecture. If we were in person, now I would take the opportunity to ask you all to introduce yourself. But in lieu of, of in-person interaction, I have an introductions discussion board on Canvas that you should visit uh, as part of your participation grade, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, where I ask you to introduce yourself and a few things about you. Uh, during the course of this 
lecture and the class overall, I'll note a couple of things on etiquette. Uh, I have this set of slides in all of my classes. This one in particular, uh, for the web mining course, since it's more of a technical course and less of a uh, discussion and socially oriented course, this may apply less, but still, uh, controversy is part of debate when we're talking about how systems work or ideas for projects or what the ethics are of collecting a lot of content from uh, online sources. You know, there's a lot of potentially ethically loaded or, or controversial content there, uh, such as opinion mining and what kind of preferences people have. Uh, when we engage with these kinds of uh, conversations, it's important that all of you remain respectful uh, and supportive during discussion. And this is ex especially important during controversial discussion. I want the classroom to be a place where we can have potentially controversial discussions and reach some consensus or at least respect that other people have different perspectives. So it's particularly important now, uh, given the current political climate, where there are a lot of concerns about the uh, role of technology and online discussion. Also, in uh, terms of etiquette for your professors, when referring to your professors, uh, generally the safe assumption is to use their title and last name. Uh, so for me, that might be Professor Bunton, uh, regardless of gender um, or what you're assumed or what, what you think the assumed gender identity may be of your professor, uh, it's best to stick with Professor Bunton. Uh, for me, though, this will be the opportunity for me to say otherwise stated. Uh, you're free to call me Cody or Professor Bunton or just Professor. I, I don't hugely care so much about, about the title. So that's an introduction about who I am, give you the opportunity to talk about who you are. Uh, let's talk now about some course materials for 688. So there is a textbook for the course. It is the Mining of Massive Data Sets textbook by Yura Leskovic, Rajamaran, and Ullman from Stanford. Uh, it is freely available online at mmds.org. There's a number of resources available to you through this website, uh, a PDF of the book at individual chapters, PDFs for slides, videos, uh, these kinds of things. I'm not going to use the slides and videos directly, I will use some of the slides and edit them and, and incorporate them into my own work, uh, but you are freely welcome to check out any of the videos. Uh, I will occasionally reference the videos or, or explicitly tell you, uh, if you want more information, go watch this video. Uh, this will be the textbook we use. In terms of prerequisites, there are three. Uh, IS 513, which is primarily programming. I think the title of that class is Programming for Informatics. Uh, the idea is for this class, you need to have some programming proficiency. Uh, I say a proficiency in Python is preferred, but the language of your proficiency is not uh, essential. You are welcome to use R, Java, Ruby, Scala, uh, or any other language that is at least moderately mainstream uh, that I can understand or will not be hugely cumbersome to run or analyze for your semester project, which we'll talk about. There's also IS 531, which is a databases course. Uh, the important points that will be helpful for you here are concepts like tables, keys, and schemas. Uh, so this image on the right has three different tables with foreign keys and primary keys uh, and column names for the different, the different fields in the rows in, these, in a database. Uh, of these three tables. It'll be useful for you to at least have an idea of this kind of structure, especially for evaluating structured data or semi-structured data like JSON uh, or converting unstructured data like text into semi or fully structured data. Uh, the schema idea in particular will be useful. The idea of keys also will be helpful. And then depending on what you do, uh, the or some familiarity with the structured query language or SQL will also be useful, uh, not entirely critical for this class, but these ideas or, or at least concepts will be valuable or help you out. Uh, the last prereq in terms of classes is 565 or 665. It's a data analytics course. Uh, in particular, it's, it's meant to help you or make sure that you have some background in statistics for things like hypothesis testing. 
so you can make claims or back up uh, claims you make about about data that you've collected to show that really you know this type of data is sufficiently or significantly different from this other type of data if you're doing some sort of analysis like that. And then visualization is also an aspect of 665 <clears throat> that will be of value in this course as well because one of the key tenants that we'll talk about around data mining and web mining is being able to uh, identify and show interesting insights uh, from large data sets. So being able to visualize that is a useful thing. Some other less class-oriented prereqs are <clears throat> proficiency in, in the command line, or if you call it the terminal or console uh, command prompt, if you're more Windows-focused. Uh, a lot of the work or examples that I will probably provide you uh, will be available through Jupyter Notebooks and being able to use uh, the console to activate Jupyter and then work with uh, content therein will be valuable to you as well. All of the course material is going to be available on Canvas. Uh, so as I sent many of you in an email yesterday, the course is now published on Canvas. Uh, I almost certain you know that because that, that will be how you found this video. Uh, unless you just came across it on YouTube. I have all the modules for the class populated, at least uh, loaded in, though the actual lecture and reading materials not loaded yet. That will be uh, made available throughout the semester as we, as we progress forward. Moving on from logistics to talking about what is 688. Uh, so first off, just from a high level, we can give you the course catalog description that web mining, the name of the course, aims to discover useful information and knowledge from the web hyperlink structure, so the structure of the internet or structure of the web, uh, page content, so we can mine content of web pages, and usage logs, so how are people engaging with um, the content on these web pages. Then web mining has direct applications in e-commerce, web analytics, information retrieval, personalization, recommendation systems, uh, a number of these other kinds of, of technologies that are, are uh, very very popular now, uh, and employees knowledgeable in these kinds of technologies are going to be highly sought after by web companies. Because primarily what they, we want to be able to do is understand user behavior and discover interesting patterns from potentially large volumes of data uh, that are contained in web scale data sets or web scale data resources. We can be a little bit more um, grounded in this in this in this description, though. Uh, a while back, Popular Science had this cover about how data is power. Uh, there are some apocryphal anecdotes about how data is worth more than oil now. Data is extremely extremely uh, valuable because the whole point is from data you can extract knowledge. But a key point about this class is that data does not necessarily equal knowledge. In order to be able to get at this knowledge, data that exists somewhere in the world must be collected, stored, and critically it needs to be analyzed. That through that analysis task can you extract the knowledge to make actions or make informed decisions about something. So in terms of the context of, of this class and other classes you may have, uh, data collection is a lot of potentially web programming and access to APIs, which we'll talk about next week, uh, just to give you access or get you some familiarity to being able to collect your own data sets from the web. Data storage, which we won't talk a huge a deal about in this class, uh, primarily will be things like databases. Uh, you can have your database class for row or column databases or NoSQL databases, these kinds of things, or data lakes if you're more familiar with uh, cloud or distributed processing or distributed computing like Amazon Web Services or the Google Cloud, these kinds of things. And then data analysis for knowledge extraction. This is data mining, data science, really the core of what this class will be about. And then the web aspect, the web mining aspect comes from large data sets that we pull from the web rather than you know, data sets you may build from sensors or like from your car or something like that. Though the world is increasingly, or the lines between those two, those kinds of uh, fields are becoming increasingly blurry with things like the, or with concepts like the Internet of Things. So another 
point about what this class is versus what this class is not. Uh, so data mining draws from a number of different areas, from machine learning to algorithms and theory, uh, from and from database systems. But critically, data mining is not machine learning. So when we talk about data mining, oftentimes we make use of machine learning or machine learning models, uh, but the emphasis on what data mining is versus what machine learning is is, is different. Uh, they both may be interested in extracting or learning some interesting insight, uh, whereas machine learning is much more about uh, training models and building algorithms that can recover behaviors or learn some interesting or uh, embedded or latent phenomena in some data. Whereas data mining, or what we're going to be doing in web mining, is much more focused on extracting useful insights. And extracting insights doesn't always require some sophisticated modeling and has a lot more emphasis on presenting that information uh, or a more human in the loop sort of, of mechanism where a human will be driving some sort of data mining process then, and then extracting those insights for business analytics or for decision making or something along those lines. Uh, and a less fully automated kind of approach that you may see with full machine learning kinds of systems. In this version of IS688, we have seven course modules. Uh, the first is an introduction and set of motivations behind web mining. Uh, what is web mining? Why do we do it? How is web mining different from data mining or data science or machine learning? And what are the motivations for extracting the actionable insights we want when we're trying to mine the web for useful data? In module two, we'll look at the internet or the web and data therein as graphs or how we can extract graphs or what graph constructs may be in web data. Graphs could be the structure of the internet versus the social networks that exist or are embedded within Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube, etc. In module three, we'll talk about how we can evaluate similarity between elements that we've extracted from the web. Maybe this is individuals and their purchasing behaviors or Netflix watching behaviors or web pages and the text that is contained therein, or the images that are contained therein. How do we take these elements and evaluate similarity between them and say two items are similar or not? And then how we can how can we reduce the computational load for this when we have potentially high dimensional data through things like hashing and dimensionality reduction? In module four, we will use what we've learned from module three and module two to do clustering where we can extract structure, some kind of reasonable structure or grouping out of web mining data or data from the web. Module 5 will move from descriptions of the data or how we can structure the data into how we can actually recommend content to individuals. So you'll see sort of elements of recommendation throughout modules 2, 3, and 4, uh, but in module 5 we'll start talking about not just looking at similar content on the web, but how we can match content to a user's or a person's previous behaviors. So that's the critical part with recommendation systems. We want to take a person's previous behavior and then recommend things to them that they like, rather than just looking at here's an item that's similar to some other item. Uh, in module six, we'll move from sort of static versions of the web, where we take essentially snapshots, and move towards a more stream-oriented version of the web, where we can look at more dynamic data. And we'll see some dynamic data in module two as well when we talk about graphs. And then finally in module seven, we have computational advertising, which is kind of a mix of recommendation systems and ad placement. What is the strategy you may use to figure out who's gonna click on your ad, uh, how do we measure the effectiveness of a particular ad campaign, a number of different things there. And computational advertising is a huge portion of what drives the economy of the web. You know, how is it that Facebook can uh, provide you its resources um, essentially free? Well, it's not really free. It, is able to monetize uh, your eyes uh, on the platform through advertising. And a lot of different platforms do this as well. A note on the MMDS. The second chapter in this book uh, focuses a lot on uh, large-scale distributed processing environments to process these large-scale uh, data sets. Now, a lot of this is built around Spark and Hadoop which are frameworks for allowing you to do massively distributed or massively parallel processing. 
uh, for dealing with web scale graphs like the Twitter or Facebook graph or the web graph that uh, Google processes for its search results, these kinds of things. Now, we will not dive deeply into Spark or Hadoop or these kinds of uh, more sophisticated technologies as part of this class, though I have a lot of experience with this. So if you have interest in using one of these technologies for your project, which we'll talk about in a minute, you are, or this is a thing that we can, we can explore together. So the course also has five core learning objectives. Uh, the first is comparing, contrasting, and collecting static web content, structured data, on structured data, usage data, and data streams. Uh, the idea is at the end of this course, you should be able to collect your own content from the web, uh, compare different kinds of content, and then be able to, des to describe and define why is static data different than data streams, these kinds of things, using data from uh, social media platforms or uh, large cloud-based databases like Google BigQuery, or pulling data from APIs, like the list of public APIs that uh, this nice GitHub repo provides us. The second learning objective is about converting on and semi-structured data into more abstract data representations that we can then process. So taking text data, image data, link data from the web, and converting it into vectors or matrices or sets that we can then use for modeling uh, for downstream analytics tasks. Things like building networks of which websites are citing or linking to other websites, like the New York Times and Washington Post often link to each other. Maybe HuffPost primarily links to the Washington Post, but WAPO does not link back to HuffPost. Converting these, these kinds of structures or the content in these websites into uh, matrices that are made up of terms and documents. How do we weight these terms and documents in a way that uh, lets us account for extremely common uh, language. Uh, so a thing we'll talk about, maybe you've been exposed to in like a natural language processing course, things like stop words that are extremely common words that have grammatical, grammatical value but less informational value. Uh, so things like the, and, or, but, those kinds of words that are, are extremely common in written text but maybe are not valuable if we're trying to provide a search engine capability or understand the topic of a particular document or a particular message. How do we deal with that and convert this sort of textual data into more uh, structured kinds of representations? The third learning objective is about implementing and analyzing sort of standard or touchstone algorithms for doing clustering, dimensionality reduction, uh, regression, or any sort of any sort of algorithm that we may use or apply to our data to extract the knowledge or interesting insights that we've talked about. Uh, for instance, this could be clustering or community analysis in a graph. It could be regression models. It could be, as I mentioned, uh, dimensionality reduction or anything along those lines. The fourth learning objective is about uh, being able to extract insights from otherwise noisy data. So one of the important things about working with web data, especially web, large web scale data, is that often this data is very messy or has a lot of information that we may not care about or a lot of data that's not uh, useful for our particular task. So the fourth, the fourth learning objective is about being able to discuss and evaluate uh, which data mining algorithms are going to be most valuable for extracting some particular insight or most applicable to a particular kind of noisy data. And then finally, the last learning objective is to work with a team to design and execute some sophisticated data mining project on data that's not already structured for your task. You'll be comparing and evaluating different design choices so you can make some claim about why, or at least justify why you chose what you chose, uh, and sort of do this from an end-to-end -end perspective. And we solve this through a semester project where you get to work either alone or, or in a uh, small team of other students to build some data mining pipeline through data collection, analysis, visualization, and presentation, which we'll talk about more uh, in a few minutes. Regarding the course schedule, recall we have seven modules we'll get through. Most of these will be done over a period of two weeks. So in week one, that's this week, we'll cover an introduction for module one, and we'll continue that into, into next week talking about 
motivations and what we want to get out of web mining. In week three, we move on to module two, looking about graphs, which we continue in week four. Uh, week five, we'll cover module three, specifically aspects of similarity or measurement thereof. And we'll continue this into week six, looking at hashing and dimensionality reduction in the beginning of October. Week seven introduces module four and clustering, and we'll continue that in the end of October. <clears throat> And then week nine, we'll start module five and recommendation systems. This is actually the largest module, it will do three weeks in total, nine, 10, and 11, which will get us through uh, Halloween and then into the beginning of November. Week 12, we'll do a uh, week on streaming, stream analysis, and then week 13, we do a week on advertising. And then week 14, we end the class with the semester presentations. And then at the end of the semester, you'll have your final project report due on December 15th. There will be no final exam for the class, no midterm for the class. The midterm for, the, for this will be your interim report on your semester project, and for the final, you have just the final project report. Note that each module has related chapters and sections to read in the textbook, Mining Massive Datasets. Uh, so this is listed in the syllabus under the different modules and chapters, and then I have specific sections outlined in Canvas under each module about not just which chapter, but specific sections in which chapter. Uh, generally, you don't have to read the whole chapter for any one of these modules, uh, but there is at least a small set of sections you should read. Uh, I will note that the reading should be done prior to the lecture, because I'll assume that you'll have some familiarity with what, with what is happening when I talk through the lecture, so lecture is going to be much more about uh, why you might do something, the motivations, where the background comes from, how you could interpret the results. And the MMDS textbook talks more about the actual mechanics of clustering or doing proofs to show that clustering on a particular method may work, or why the recommendation system based on uh, items tend to outperform recommendation based on users. So you'll get more detail, more fine detail in the textbook and more high-level motivation and connections with the rest of the field and what we're doing in the lecture. So yeah, reading should be reviewed beforehand. Uh, other policies and grading distributions, that's what we'll talk about now. Uh, well, this, the, head, the heading here is wrong. There are three parts to your grade, actually. Uh, the first is module assignments. So there are, I think, six or seven assignments throughout the course of the semester. Uh, that account for 50% of your grade uh, collectively. So no single, um, no single assignment counts for more than 10%. Um, and then your final project is 40% of your grade, again, spread out over uh, five different categories or five different uh, elements to the final project, which we'll talk about in a minute. And then 10% is about participation. Uh, a key point, uh, a thing that I'm doing this semester that I've not done in the past, is I have a, uh, a lax late policy. Uh, I will not assess any penalty for late homework or late submissions for the module assignments. Uh, some of the research I've read on this suggests that penalties are not, these late penalties are not useful uh, in terms of motivating you to get your work done and in fact often are, are very detrimental to your grade. So my late policy used to be <clears throat> no more than five days or any assignment cannot be turned in no more than five days after the deadline, uh, but zeros in the grade book have a huge impact on your overall course average. This is not a, uh, a useful thing I, I feel anymore. Um, but the way you get to submit your module assignments, which I'll talk about, will be through medium posts. So you'll be able to see well how many of your fellow students have also or have, have submitted their uh, assignments so far, and what do they what do they look like? Uh, so I encourage you to keep at least some amount of tabs on how the, the overall class is, pr is progressing. If you end up submitting all of your module assignments at the end of the semester, um, while it's not, it's not forbidden, forbidden from, from the late policy, uh, do note that if I have to stay up really late grading all of your uh, assignments at the very last minute and then you get poor grades on them as a result, you'll have less opportunity to work with me or talk about uh, how to address your grades. 
In terms of the late policy for other assignments though, I note that participation and the semester project assignment deadlines are more strict. Uh, participation primarily because the whole point for the participation aspect is to get you to be more engaged over the course of the semester rather than waiting for everything at the end. And certain parts of participation in the semester project require uh, you're working with colleagues or you're working with your other with your fellow students meaning that we have to do some scheduling or set aside some time where all of us are working on the same uh, same thing which we'll see when, we, when I talk more about the semester project all right there are a number of other uh, policies to that you can review the main one is about academic integrity uh, you are absolutely welcome to use resources like Stack Overflow or any online resource to get to get help or assist in your in, in your work. I'm 100% okay with that, but it is critical that you attribute where you got your work. So if you are submitting uh, code, a comment that says you got this code from Stack Overflow or where you got this code, or if you are writing uh, part of your Medium post that says what you did and how you did it and what the code looks like, uh, if you are quoting from something, that's fine, but it's it's important that you attribute where you got the content from. Uh, if I suspect that you are cribbing content without uh, correctly attributing it, I am required by the university to submit that information to uh, the Dean of Students for review as an academic integrity violation. So nobody wants to deal with that. Uh, it's just much easier for you to say, hey, this is a quote from this paper, this article, this medium post. Uh, this is this chunk of code comes from this GitHub repo or this Stack Overflow posting. Now we'll talk about the homework for this class, which is in the form of module assignments. There are five core assignments here each one is associated with a particular module where you get to explore and leverage the material you learn from that module into an article or write-up where you've extracted some useful information or potentially actionable insight from the data and then in, in addition to this you have assignment zero is a very straightforward one about just signing up for a medium account uh, all of these assignments use medium the idea here is that by posting content in a public venue that the quality of work tends to be higher that the the knowledge that other people can read your work tends to increase the amount of effort that students put in and at the end of the semester you have the opportunity uh, to or at least have built up a portfolio of interesting kinds of, of writing samples and code samples that you can then share uh, I actually have done this a, a couple of times in the past, and a number of the articles that have been posted to the class medium posts have gotten featured on other article or other medium, uh, other medium publications, and have led to I think some entering interesting and valuable interactions for the students uh, who have engaged with it. If you are unable to use Medium for some plat. Uh, for some reason, uh, it is imperative that you get in touch with me before Friday, January 29th. That's a week from this coming Friday, uh, so we can work out some accommodation. You can see some examples. So as I mentioned, I've done this in the past. Uh, I did this last semester for my social media course. You can see examples at this medium.com slash social media theories, ethics, and analysis uh, for a number of different assignments and final projects. So you can see sort of what I'm expecting there. A uh, colleague of mine at the University of Colorado in Boulder has done a similar thing uh, in his information expositions class. So you can see what he's done and what his students have done there as well. Uh, and there are some other examples that you can check out. Uh, I have another set of slides about creating uh, medium content. I'll post those in the Canvas page as well. The next core part of the class is the semester project. The real goal here is to get you to go deeper onto a particular subject or explore a data set in a much more thorough way, as opposed to the module assignments, which are supposed to be relatively quick. Uh, you rapidly apply one particular kind of method to some small data set. Here, what we want you to do is go deeper. 
you have the entire semester to engage with a particular data set to do a number of, of different things, explore the data set and go deeper into the kinds of methods you use, the kind of insights you want to extract, etc. The assignment itself is divided into five parts. There's the project proposal, there's a data collection report, there's the intermediate report and review, there's an actual presentation at the end, and then finally you have a medium report uh, that sort of bookends the entire process. Some ideas that you may use for the project could include applying techniques that you've learned from class to large-scale data that you've extracted from the web to identify un unique or interesting insights. You could take a number of different techniques from the class and apply them to data in an interesting way uh, and then compare how they get used and what the advantages and disadvantages are of each. You could say, well, I, I've learned a bunch of stuff from this class, but I think I have a new way of doing something, or I think we can tweak this particular method to make it better and extend some, something that we've talked about in class. So there's lots of opportunities for that. And there's a lot of different ways or a lot of different ideas that you could explore here. So if you have questions, what might be a reasonable idea, by all means, reach out. Note that the proposal for your project is due quite soon. It's actually due two weeks from the beginning of class. That's September 15th at midnight. Uh, unlike the module assignments, the semester projects do have a hard deadline because uh, the semester projects go across the semester, so it's important to maintain cadence here. So there are a number of different questions to ask about, or to answer rather, about the proposal. Uh, for ideas for uh, how you can get for ideas about the project, there is a, like I said, there's a discussion forum here. You can share your ideas. I encourage you to start thinking about or brainstorming ideas uh, as soon as possible so I can give you feedback on them. And you can start to see other people's ideas in the class and build your teams if you're interested in collaborating. So I'll give you some, some sample project ideas. Uh, one is to use some large scale data set like the Yelp open data set to explore some uh, interesting kinds of questions, like predicting ratings for a given restaurant or for restaurants from review text. So using regression models or something along those lines to say, given these, this set of, of words in this, in this review, how many stars are we going to give this restaurant? Uh, you can construct some search engine to help find local businesses based on some query. You can build some recommendation system that, that says, given some query or given some uh, ex example business, uh, show some other businesses that are similar to it. Because the Yelp open data set has uh, content about metropolitan areas, you can do something kind of fun or weird and say, well, if you like one metro area, you may like this other metro area. So build a recommendation system for that. Uh, you can cluster businesses into different genres, explore the clustering algorithms that we've talked about in class. You can work with Twitter. This is a lot of uh, what I do to build recommend, recommender systems for friends, uh, build models to predict Twitter engagement. So the Rexis challenge, Rexis is a conference on recommendation systems. Their challenge last year was building models for predicting Twitter engagement. Um, if you do something like that, you can engage with these, with these challenges and get a potential publication at the end or at least attend some workshop. Uh, you can use Twitter to find COVID hotspots, uh, I am actually a co-coordinator of the Trek Incident Streams task, where we use social media to rank content uh, posted in the aftermath of disasters uh, to help support emergency response officers. So you're welcome to use data from here uh, to do things like identify volunteers or people who are willing to volunteer in the aftermath of crises, uh, rank social media content by how critical it is that somebody sees it, recommend tweets that are likely to contain rumors uh, for somebody who wants to do fact checking or uh, evaluation. Uh, Facebook does this actually, or it does a similar kind of thing. You can use some sports API to do things like predict sports team scores is what I did when I was much younger in, in my machine learning class. Uh, with the public APIs, GitHub repo that I mentioned earlier on or that I showed early on. There are a lot of APIs that you can use, some for transportation, so you can do like build a regression model for predicting flight prices based on content that you can pull from these APIs plus content from a news site or something, predict or alert on, on traffic congestion. Google 
uh, makes the Google Books API freely available, so you can use this to do book recommendations uh, by pulling information about books. If you're interested in the stock market, there's a, a website called Alpha Vantage, or a, a company called Alpha Vantage. Uh, they have a an API for doing stocks, and they actually have a free version of the API for educators and students. So if you are interested in the and doing stock market prediction, for example. Uh, let me know, and if you're interested in using Alpha Vantage, we can explore that. There's another another uh, Trek task called the Trek News Task, where they're interested in doing recommendation around uh, news articles, so giving you context for a particular news article, what other news articles might you want to read. Um, so you might use this data to do author mining to figure out you know who wrote a particular a particular article or font like do web crawling where you find other articles written by a given author or recommend articles or authors based on uh, some query or some example author. It's like, oh, if you like author A, you'll also like author B. Or if you like article A, here's 12 other articles you may read. I'll note uh, sentiment analysis. I do not enjoy projects that are primarily geared around sentiment analysis. So I generally do not allow sentiment analysis projects. Uh, you are welcome to use sentiment analysis in your project, but your project must be more than just an analysis of sentiment. Uh, sentiment analysis is a dangerous but appealing kind of kind of analysis because it's everybody has like a an intuitive understanding of what sentiment analysis may be. Does content um, express some positive or negative attitude towards something or some neutral attitude towards something? But the reality is sentiment analysis is very complex. Uh, you have to deal with things like negation. Uh, sarcasm is really hard. But there are a lot of very easy libraries or very accessible libraries for doing sentiment analysis quickly and badly. So if you're going to do sentiment analysis, uh, you have to be very careful about it. Uh, as a result, I tend to just say, you know, do not do a project that's focused on sentiment analysis. If you're trying to do stock market prediction or flight prediction or something like that, like a flight price prediction, sentiment analysis will, could, could be a useful signal, so you're welcome to use it, but the key point of your project, the useful in insight, must not be sentiment analysis. It must be some something more than that. So as I mentioned, any ideas that you have, please post them in the discussion forum. Uh, you'll get good feedback, and this will be a place if you want to work with or find uh, fellow students to work with you. This will be a good place to do that. So yes, please post here. A new thing I'm doing in 688 this year for these semester projects is I'm requiring each one of your teams to schedule a weekly meeting with me. Now the idea here is that these meetings will be super brief and talk about what you've done, issues you've encountered, and give me the opportunity to give you quick feedback on what you've done and where you can go. So in the previous semesters of this class, I've found that some of the issues that the teams encounter could be easily fixed if they were just have the five minutes to like run an idea by me or ask me a question. So I could give you some insight about where you can go for data, where you can go to you know, find libraries to help you do these things. Are you going down a, a particularly hard path? Uh, I want to make sure that you, you get something out of your project. So this is an opportunity for you to engage with me uh, on a regular basis to see where you are and what's a good path forward. So uh, once you've set up your teams, once you've figured that out, you can schedule a weekly call with me. This is The idea here is to at least get that on, on the books uh, by next week, or by the middle of next week so we can know how to move forward. And it'll give you more opportunity to refine your ideas for your project proposal that'll be due in a couple of weeks. Participation is a core part of any sort of learning experience. Uh, this is no different e even though this class is online and fully asynchronous. So there are a number of things that we could do for participation in terms of uh, in-person meetings or in-person classes are, are not easily uh, amenable to this kind of environment, but there are still important parts of the participation grade that you'll have for this class. Uh, in particular, I have discussion forums for each module. Uh, by all means, you are welcome to post any questions you have about any of the material there. I will respond to them. You're welcome to respond to your fellow students. Even if it's 
interesting insights you've had or uh, comments you have about the material and how you've seen it in your everyday life or in the work that you've do that you've been doing just engaging in the discussion forums is a super easy way to get participation points in addition uh, you have the introductions participation or you have the introductions discussion forum where you get to introduce yourself you have the project ideas forum where you can talk about that and you have opportunities to meet with me you have these weekly meetings with your semester project team and myself. So that's opportunities for your whole team to meet with me. But you can also take advantage of the virtual office hours for one-on-one -on -one meetings. So essentially what I'll do is I'll have a WebEx meeting or a Zoom meeting uh, from Thursdays 2 to 3 p.m. And you can just drop into these office hours as you like. All right, that's it for your introduction into the class. Uh, some things to start working on for next week. Uh, so first, there's some readings, specifically read sections 1.1, 1.4, and 1.5 of chapter 1. Uh, it should be very short. 1.1 is basically an overview of data mining. Uh, 1.4 and 1.5 are some review and outlines of the book. And 1.3 is a set of, of useful concepts that you should at least have some familiarity with. Uh, so if you already, if you can skim 1.3, if there's things that you're already, if you're already familiar with everything in there, that's great. If you're not, uh, read those a little bit more closely because we'll use basically every concept uh, that's in 1.3. Also, read Chapter 6, specifically Sections 6.1 and 6.2. Uh, 6.1 is, is basically a, an introduction to frequent item set mining, which is kind of one of the early motivations we'll, we will have for data mining. And 6.2 is an algorithm for actually doing the frequent item set mining. It should be probably the most sophisticated kinds of, of math that we'll deal with over the course of the semester. Uh, also, you need to sign up for Medium. Give me your Medium account name because I'll be creating a uh, course publication that will have all of us uh, listed as contributors so you can submit content to the Medium application when you submit your uh, homework assignments. Do your introductions and be on your toes here with the semester project, because as I've mentioned, your project proposal is due in two weeks. Now it's supposed to be relatively brief. It's a 200 word document. It can evolve, especially as we have these uh, weekly meetings with your semester project team and myself. The idea is to give you a framework for the kind of problem you're interested in, who's going to be working on that project with you, and what kind of technology you intend to use. So there's opportunities for uh, change here, but I do want to at least have some proposal on the books within a couple of weeks. As I mentioned, there's a project ideas discussion forum where you can go and share these ideas. You can engage with me to get my feedback. You can see what other people are, are thinking about doing. So I encourage you to take advantage of this space. All right, so if you have any questions, by all means, post in the discussion forum, reach out to me uh, via email, and welcome to 688.